distance from the point 4, negative 3, 7 to, and I'm going to ask you a couple of things here. Part A, the xy plane, B, the yz plane, C, the xz plane. Let's start with those. Okay. Anyone have the answer for, for um, part A? What do you got? Seven. Seven. So how are you getting that? Because imagine like a plane that's seven away from the Z plane. Okay. So you're just seeing it. You're just seeing it, right? I mean, okay. So let me move. Let me let me try and move to this point in the room. All right. So here we go. I'm gonna go out four units this way. Right. I'm gonna go three units that way, and then I'm gonna go up seven <coughs> units, right? Up seven units. So let's say I'm at the ceiling, right there. The question is first, how, what's the shortest distance from that point on the ceiling to the YZ plane, which is where? YZ. Uh, sorry, I said, I said YZ, I meant to say XY, part A. Where's the XY plane? The floor, sorry, I said YZ. XY plane is down here, right? So what's the distance from there to there? Seven. Well, how far did we go up? Yeah. Seven, right? So we're seven units away. So the answer to this, seven units, whatever, the, whatever it's measured in. Okay, so go back to that point. We came out four, we went three this way. And now I want to know how far away I am from the YZ plane. So where is the YZ plane? That back wall, okay? That back wall. So how did I get over here? How far did I come this way? Four. four. So I'm four units away. The shortest distance is four. Do we understand that it's the shortest distance? Okay. Because of course, if I'm standing here, I could be like distance from here to like over there. That wouldn't be four. The shortest distance would be when I'm like perpendicular. Okay. And now same thing. I'm over here. How far away am I from the XZ plane? The xz plane is x, and then z is up. So it's like that wall that was right here. I'm on the other side of it. So how far away am I? Three units. So we're looking at it as a distance. So three units. Any questions on those? OK, part D. Find the shortest distance. So I'm just continuing. Find the shortest distance from that point to the x-axis. Hmm, now that's different. So, let me, let me start out, let me walk to my point again here. I'm supposed to go out that way four, this way three, and up seven. So I'm up there, right? I want to know the shortest distance between that point and what? The x-axis, which is right here on the ground, right? Right here on the ground. So from there down to there. It's different, right? It's a little different. But do you know that point? Do you know the x, y, and z coordinate of that point? Do you know the point on the x-axis that you should be looking at? What point on the x-axis should you be looking at? Four. Uh, four, zero, zero, right? So it's kind of like this. I'm going to try and draw it this way. Um, x, y, here's my x, here's my y, here's my z. So I came out one, two, three, four, right? I came negative on the y, one, two, three, and I went up seven. So I'm up here. Yes? And I'm trying to find the distance between this point and that point. That would be the shortest distance, wouldn't it? So I know this point was 4, negative 3, 7. And this point, just by my kind of brain, 
right? Thinking, visualizing is the point four zero zero. And so now you can use the distance formula. You could also do a Pythagorean and just do a triangle, right triangle, but you can go straight to the formula. This would be d equals square root of difference of the x-coordinates, zero, plus difference of the y-coordinates, negative three, or you could say positive three, depending on how you want to do it, squared, plus difference of the z-coordinates, squared, uh, 49. All right, so what do we get here? Root 58. And we'll just leave it like that. Leave it as an exact answer. Right? Leave it as an exact answer, not an approximation. So the square root of 58 units. So what do you think we could ask on parts uh, E and F? Shortest distance to the y-axis. Shortest distance to the z-axis, right? It would work exactly the same. You'd have to find the corresponding points. Okay? Questions there? Are you all visualizing this okay? Are you, are you seeing it? Okay. Um, This one might be a little bit harder. Find the equation of the sphere um, centered at the point three four, five, which is tangent to the z-axis. All right. So we need to, we need to actually kind of understand what we mean by this, all right? Give you a second to jot that down. We got about 30 minutes, 35 minutes, until we're halfway. <laughs> Just reminding you, yes? I, well, that's what we need to figure out, is R5, is the rate. So when we're sitting here looking at this, <clears throat> This is one of the things about this class because it is so dense. There's so much material here. When you're asked a question, it's very important, I think, to understand, you know, like, what do I want, right? So what are they asking for here? What do they want? The equation of a sphere. Okay, that's what they want. What is the equation of a sphere? Well, we know that the equation of any sphere is x minus h squared plus y minus k squared plus z minus l squared equals r squared, right? Do we know any of this yet? Do we know what any of this is? Yes. yes. We know actually a lot of it, don't we? Yes. We know h, k, and l, don't we? Yes. So we, we know up to this point, x minus 3 squared plus y minus 4 squared plus z minus 5 squared equals r squared. So the only thing we don't know is the radius. So it makes sense now for us to go after the radius. So if, imagine we've got this sphere. I'm going to go, I'm going to go walk to its center. Here we go. Ready? One, two, three. This way. One, two, three, four. And then up five. One, two, three, four, five. So here I am, right? That's the center of my sphere. My sphere is going around this. I need this sphere to be tangent to the z-axis. What do I mean by that? What do I mean by that? Go ahead. It means the outer surface of the sphere is just barely touching the z-axis. That's right, at one point, yes. right? So where's my z-axis? It's back here, right? Like this? Okay, so I got this point. The sphere opens up, comes through here, and just touches 
just touches that axis, right? It can't go, it can't go past it, can't be short of it. It just has to touch at one single point. So if this is, if this is my sphere, imagine a radius line coming straight out and boom, hitting that, right? Right? So how high up is the point that I'm going to hit at? Same height as my center of my sphere. So I come out five. So really, I just need to know the distance between here and here, don't I? The distance between those two points. That'll give me my radius. So what's the first point? So I need the distance between uh, three, four, five, and what's the other point that's on the z-axis? Zero, zero, five. Right? Because we're, if we're back here, all we did is come up five and we just kind of look out to the center of the sphere. And that should be where the radius just barely touches. Do you all understand that if that radius goes any, anywhere further, you're not tangent anymore? Yeah? In short, of course, you're not going to touch the z-axis. All right. Well, distance formula for that. So the distance between those two. Difference of the x-coordinate squared. Difference of the y-coordinate squared. Difference of the z-coordinates squared, which is 0, which is root 25. So 5 units. Okay. Now, is this number always this number then? No, it's just a coincidence, right? So you said five earlier, right? Yeah, was, I thought it was a coincidence. Okay. I was going to say, wow, that's pretty quick no, computation you got there. I thought it was, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so that's just a coincidence that it was five. It's, it's, it's not always that way. All right, so we're not done. The final answer then would be this equals 25. There we go. So if we were able to graph that sphere, it would have a center here, radius of 5. It would just touch the z-axis. All right, I think that's good. Let's look at this. Let's look at this inequality. Well, you know, I'll do it this way. Do we all know what that is? Circle? Centered where? Zero, zero. Center, radius? Three. Okay, so it's all those points that are on that circle, right? Okay, what about this? And inside, all the way down to nothing, right? A disk, right? Yeah, so it's this, but not the edge, right? So I'd do something like this, but everything in it, right? Okay, so we've got what, three here, right? What about the inside radius? Two, oh, two, and I want this to be bigger than or equal to this, so, right? But this one I want just less than, so, it, well, not a washer you could physically make because you can't include the boundary, 
right? So it's more theoretical. Now, if it was, but it does look like a washer. Who said washer? I'm hearing it, but I don't know where it's come from. Yes. So it's like a washer, but we could never construct a washer without a boundary. Yes? All right. So <clears throat> with that idea, what if I have this three-dimensional solid ball? Okay, so you'll see this three-dimensional solid ball? It's solid all the way through. And I'm going to tell you the radius of this is 5. Can you give me an expression like I gave you over there that would somehow draw this ball? And, and I'm going to say it's centered at the origin. I saw a shaking head yes. I'm assuming you got something there. What do you got, sir? Uh, x squared plus y squared plus z squared is less than or equal to uh, square root of 5. Uh, the radius is 5, so just 25. Oh, there we go. So do you all see how this is similar to what we just did? This right here is like the equation of a sphere centered at the origin. And then our radius is 20, uh, sorry, is 5. Right, that's r squared, and then we want everything less than or equal to it. So it's, it's this solid ball including the boundaries. Right? Now why don't I have to put anything like over here greater than or equal to zero? Why don't I have to do that? Because the zero is at the origin. These things squared added together can never be anything less than zero, never be negative. So you don't need that there. You could put it there and still be correct, but you don't need it there. All right, now, <clears throat> what if I want to make this a coconut? All right, so I want to hollow out the inside. And maybe I want the inside, I want to hollow out the inside, I don't know, how big do you want to hollow out? Maybe ball inside there that's radius of what? What do you want the radius to be? Um, just make, it, make the radius, in this case, two. So two. we end up having four, or four less than Put it in here, right? Four less than or equal to, there you go. Now if you do that, that gives you all the points that are inside the ball of radius 5, but outside and including the edge of the ball of radius 2. Understand? Okay. What would this give you? What would this give you if I gave you this inequality in three-dimensional space? So if we're in three-dimensional space, and I give you z equals 5, what does that give you in three-dimensional space? Plane, right? Parallel to the x, y plane, right? Yes. Okay, but what if I change that to z greater than or equal to 5? What did you call it? A space. a space. So this is no longer a flat sheet of paper. It's every flat sheet of paper from five up. And so we consider that to be sometimes called a half space, although it's not technically half of an infinite space, but the book calls it half space. It's a half space, or you could just call it a space. So this is just a space. It's a solid region, an infinite region above and equal to z equals five, right? And if I threw in, let's say I squeezed it, right? I squeezed it between, let's say, there. Now you've got the plane z equals 1, z equals 5. Everything in between it, this, it's like this infinite slab that goes out in every direction, right? But its height is restricted between 1 and 5. I was trying to get you to kind of visualize these things and see how it relates to things you've done already. You know, when we've done something like this before, like, we always looked at that as being, okay, here are x coordinate, you know, we're, be we're between one and three and everything in between, right? It's like a closed interval. But now that we're in three-dimensional space, this is not a little closed interval, it's this huge slab, infinite slab. So the space you're working in has a huge impact on what you're looking at, like, geometrically. <clears throat> All right, one more problem out of this. 
And then I think we'll be ready to, I don't know what we're going to do, but <clears throat> take our break. Um, I'd like for us to, Find the equation of the sphere. Uh, not, not the equation, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Find the find the radius and the center of the sphere. And I'm going to give you the equation of the sphere. Let me see which one of these I want. Yeah. 3x squared plus 3y squared plus 3z squared equals 10 plus 6y plus 12z. So would you agree that if, if someone provides you with the radius and center and gives you that, you can come up with the equation, no problem, because you just plug it into the formula. But what if someone gives you the equation of a sphere and then asks you to recover the radius and the center? Well, you've got to make that equation look like the standard form. You've got to somehow turn that into eight, x minus h squared plus y minus k squared plus z minus l squared, right, equals r squared. Somehow, this has to become that. Right? And then you can say, oh, I, I see what h, k, and l are, and I can see what r is, right? But how are we going to get this to that? Any, any ideas? It's one of your favorite things. I'll give you a hint. It's not in completing a triangle. Completing a it's completing a square. Yeah, we're going to have to complete the square here. Now, completing the square, let's do one problem of completing the square on the side, completely separate from this. And I just want to see how everyone does it. Because there are, there are not, I'm not going to say incorrect ways, but there are ways that are dangerous, all right? So I'd like for us to do this right here. All right, here we go. I'm going to do this one, 3x squared just ignore that. We're going to come back to this. Uh, I want to kind of kill two birds with one stone here. 3y squared plus 12, 6y, geez. Just ignore me. Okay. Good old completing the square on a quadratic. So what's the first step when you complete the square on something? Do what? You gotta set up the square. What do you mean set up the square? Mm. No? You have to make like the term with the high school because it have to have like a Yes. You start with it so it's in descending order right now, right? Highest power down. You have to make sure that this coefficient is a one. Okay? So how can you make that coefficient a one? Factor out the three. Factor out the three. Right? Factor out the 3. So I'm, I'm going to ignore the 10 completely. I'm going to factor the 3 out. Right? Be left with y squared plus 2y. OK? And then I still have plus 10 here. Now what's the next piece? Yeah, okay, yeah, it's the 2y, so you take the number in front of the y here, and it's positive 2, and you do something with it. Half of it, take half of it, and square it. 
What's half of, half of two? I'll do that on the side here. I take my little positive two. I take half of it. You always take half of the number, no matter what, when you're completing the square. So that's going to be one. Then you take that answer and you square it. That gives you one. So what do you do with that one? This is the part I want to hear. This is the part I really, this is the dangerous part. Add it on to the end how? Um, wait, you add it to the uh, y squared plus 2y plus 1, and then you add it to the other side as well. OK, so you add it to both sides? Mm -hmm. Yes. That's the dangerous part. OK, so what? When you say add 1, you want me to add 1 here? Yeah. OK, and add 1 here. You'd add yeah, that, that, would get tricky. that wouldn't work, because watch, if I add 1 here, if I just put in here plus 1, then when this distributes back 3, I really added 3, didn't I? So I'd have to add 3 here, right? OK, and that's where things get dangerous. Not only that, what if I didn't give you an equation? What if I just gave you an expression and asked you to complete the square? Then you don't have two sides of an equation to work with. OK, so the, the way that I recommend you complete the square is as follows. This is just so you don't get yourself in trouble later. You still go through this process. We, we remember, we have this 1 here, right? That's what we got. We get to half of that, squared it, we got 1. Here's what I'm going to do with that 1. 3, y squared plus 2y. Here comes the magic 1. All I'm going to do with it is add it and subtract it right there. OK? There's my, there, there it is. I added the 1 and subtracted the 1. So I haven't changed the problem, have I? No. Haven't changed the problem at all. Then I still have plus 10 equals 0. Now, just look at this. These first three are guaranteed to be factorable. What is y squared plus 2y plus 1 factor to be? y plus 1, that quantity, squared. So here's what I have next. 3, parenthesis, y plus 1, quantity squared. That's these first three. Then what do I still have here? Minus 1, close parenthesis, plus 10 equals 0. Now, pass your 3 to here and here. So I'm going to I'll just finish it up over here. If I pass my 3 to this. And this, I'll, I'll get that parenthesis out of there. So I've got 3, y plus 1 squared minus 3 plus 10 equals 0. And now I'm pretty much there. I can just put these together and get a 7. OK, so this is the way I recommend you do completing the square. Because if you do it with this inside here, just add it and subtract it, you're not changing the problem. I mean, that's 0, right? But here, if you do it this way, you don't have to depend on adding anything to both sides. And that, that can become dangerous. And it can also become problematic if the equal sign was never there. Which in Cal 2, you should have run into this problem doing integration. You should have had an integral where you had to look at the bottom, which was quadratic, and had to complete the square on it. And there was no two sides of an equation to complete the square on. So it may have already creeped its little ugly head at you in the past. OK, so now back to this. We have to complete the square here for all three variables, x, y, and z. So that means I'm going to get everything together here on one side. 3x squared. Do I have any x's over there? I do not, right? Plus 3y squared uh, minus 6y. Oh, we had, oops, I didn't I have to do it over again. Plus 3z squared minus 12z equals 10. So I just first start by rewriting the whole thing. I'm just going to leave the 10 on the right hand side, but I'm bringing all the variable terms over and I'm collecting them together with their corresponding letters. So y's together, z's together. <clears throat> so on the x, do I need to complete the square? No, no, no. the x, I just have x squared, right? I don't have any other things. So that I'm, that I'm okay with. That's actually 3 times x minus 0 squared. That's one way you could look at this first piece. So it's kind of like I have x minus something squared, right? OK. Next one, plus. Now I've got to complete the square on those two right there. 
right? So I've got to go do that little work on the side or however you want to do it. What do I do first? Factor out the three. Okay, so if I factor the three out, left with y squared minus two uh, y. Take half of that and then square it. So it's gonna be that one again, isn't it? Yes. So you're gonna add and subtract one here. So let me, let me do it on the next line. I don't know how much detail you want me to show. Here's my little add and subtract one. Do you subtract, do you subtract then add? No, you always add then subtract, right? Because that number, when you square it, when you take that number in the middle and you take half of it and square it, that'll always be positive, right? So you're always gonna do add then subtract. Okay, what about the Z's? What do I have to do for the Z's? I'll get back to that in a second. What about the Z's here? Pull the three, right? Pull the three. Z squared minus 4z, take half of that, square it. So I'm going to add and subtract 4 to that. So plus 3z uh, squared minus 4z, here comes me adding and subtracting 4. I'm out of room, sorry. It's going to happen. And then equals 10. Let's keep going. We're almost there. X minus zero squared. Okay, plus three. What what happens to this? What does this become? That becomes uh, y minus one squared. Okay, so y minus one, that quantity squared, and then minus one yes. still, right? So we get the quantity y minus one, that quantity squared, then still minus one. That's all still in the parentheses with a three out here. And then we have plus three, and then what about inside that other parenthesis with a z? Z minus two squared. Z minus two, that quantity squared. And I still have on the outside minus four, right? So these three right here became z minus two, that quantity squared. Then I still have minus four. Then I have equals 10. <clears throat> Y'all following that? All right, there we go. I mean, we're, we're, we're almost there. Okay, three x minus zero squared plus three y minus one squared minus three plus three z minus two squared minus 12 equals 10. So all I did here was distributed here and here, here and here. <clears throat> and now I'm gonna collect all my numbers together. Negative 15, move it to the other side. 25, and then all of these still have three in front, don't they? So I have one more step. What's my one more step? Yeah, I've got to divide both sides by three because the, the standard form does not have the coefficient in front, right? Well, it's one, right? So we've got to get rid of that three, that three, that three. So divide everything by three, and that will bring us to the end. We'll have x minus zero squared plus y minus one squared plus z minus two squared equals 25 thirds. So what's the center of this thing? Nope. The center is 0, 1, 2. And what's the radius of this thing? Careful, we divide it by 3. So what is it? 5 over root 3. Take the top and bottom there. OK, that's good. 5 squared is 3 Or you could write 5 root 3 over 3. Are these both acceptable answers? Yes. I thought, I thought a lot of us were taught never to leave a radical in the denominator. I don't 
free time to do that a lot. What's your thought on that? I'm about to give you a break, but I just want to know your thought on that. Like, I it's a presentation thing. Presentation? Yeah, it'd be nice. <clears throat> I mean, they give you numerically the same answer, right? Do you have an opinion? Yeah, I was always taught to believe on the bottom, but if you know how to do the math, it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. So how many of you feel like you were told like not to leave it on the bottom? Anyone really? OK. Yeah. Yeah, I was taught the same thing. And then they were like, uh, like, never mind. Like, never mind? Say, they changed their mind? They Don't. changed their mind. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. I, I, I want us to think about that for a second. Okay? Because there's actually a little bit of history here. A little bit of... It bothered me for a long time that those two answers are numerically the same, but I was being told not to leave the radicals in the bottom. In fact, I had problems counted wrong because I left the radical in the bottom. So if you have, if you, if you are told to rationalize a denominator, then yes, you have to do it because you're, that's what you're being asked to do. But why is there this sense that it has to be done? Well, it comes, oh, go ahead. Uh, I, I thought it was, I was going to say it comes back to the unit circle, sort of, in a way. Oh, like point. if you want to recognize certain numbers, yes. like the common ones? Yes. If you don't rationalize, you may not recognize them, yeah. right? True. But outside of that, like you go back like old school, you find some old school professor, they're going to tell you, like, you need to you know, get that radical out of there. You can't leave it. Here's why, OK? Here's why. Before calculators, back in the old days of the slide rules and doing things by hand, OK, before computers, you would, you would actually have competitions to see who could memorize certain numbers, like the most digits of a number, like pi, right? Pi is, what, 3.1415, but it doesn't ever stop. It never repeats, right? Just keeps going forever. There's a lot of numbers like that. Square root of two is another one of them. And every irrational number is a non-repeating, non-terminating decimal. So these numbers that would come up in mathematics a lot before computers, these numbers, people who are in the STEM fields would, would have to memorize these, the ones that came up a lot. And they would have to memorize you know, a certain amount. In fact, m one of my colleagues told me that he used to have pi out to 120 digits. He's actually, I've, I've seen him, like he has done it in, in my presence, he's gone out 60 digits with it correctly. And you know, so like that's, now when I say one of my colleagues, he's an older colleague, he's like 70 years old. So, you know, back in his day, that was like how you kind of like, you know, it was like, yeah, I know pi out 100 digits. How about you? Okay, so I want us to imagine that we're back in the days without calculators and we're asked to actually compute this. Let's just take that example right there. Think about what you would have to do numerically to do this. You would come in with your old school division box. What would go inside the box? One. Okay, now, root two would have to go on the outside, but you would have to have that memorized, right? So you would have to, you know, put out here like 1.414, whatever, however many digits you want to go, and then you have to go through this very nasty task. Look at this. How many times does 1.414 go into one? Well, it doesn't, right? So what would we have to do? We'd have to say, okay, how many times does it go into 10? So how many times does 1.414 go into 10? Six, you, you, right? Do you see that this is not super clean? Okay, rationalize, the, rationalize this now, okay? So what would this be if you rationalize a denominator? Multiply top and bottom by root two, so you get root two over two. Now what happens here? Now your division box is the root two, which is the 1.414, and outside what do you have? The two, and see the divisor is clean. So now when you're trying to go, okay, two doesn't go into one, fine. Two goes into 14, seven, right, 0.7. And then you can continue on, and this would be a lot easier to do by hand than it would be to do this way. You see that? This is preferred if you don't have a calculator, right? But we have calculators, so this is fine. This, these two are the same. There is nothing hard, there's no hard rule that says you must rationalize denominators. And I, I don't ever do it. 
unless I have to. Now, I do want to balance that by saying that the technique of rationalizing something is important. The technique of it is good. Because um, if it's numerical, they have the same quantity, but in algebra, rationalizing has allowed us to simplify expressions to get things to cancel, like when we were doing limits and things like that. So the actual technique is important, but numerical answers makes no difference. Do you, do you see how yeah. this is? Okay. All right, let's take a break. It's 3.38, and let's go take a, let's just come back here at 3.50. All right, I'm going to mute.
Okay, <clears throat> let's let's carry on. I, yes, I did. Thank you, though. Um, all right, so we're gonna uh, jump into the next section here: vectors. How many of you have some experience with vectors? Okay, so um, vectors, from from the perspective of mathematicians, vectors are actually more general than what you learn in like physics. But in engineering, a lot of you know vectors as just being like a sequence of numbers and angle brackets, but they can be more abstract than that. We are going to stick with the general definition, or not the general, the specific definition that you see in physics and engineering. So um, they are any object that has two properties, a length and a direction. Okay, so that's what that's the way we're going to define a vector. Any, any object that has some sort of length and direction. So, yeah, never mind. I'm not going to get abstract on you. Just, I think, I think we all have a visual idea of what a vector is. Um, so, two dimension, in two-dimensional space, a vector is any object that has some sort of length. So, we have a distance from here to here and some sort of direction. So, we need an arrow to say we're pointing in that direction as opposed to the opposite direction. And we'll label this with a, um, most books use a, like a bold letter, but since it's difficult to write in bold, right, when you're writing, we just use a letter with kind of a half arrow on top, and that's our notation for a vector. I can change the direction, I can change the length of a vector, right? So it can be pointed in two-dimensional space, pointed pretty much anywhere, right? The important thing about the vector is that its position doesn't matter. So we're going to talk about that. Here's a vector in three-dimensional space. So any object having a length and a direction. So some of the language we have here. Oh, oh. Again, it's in bold or it can be V with the little half arrow. Where we start, the, you know, where we point from here to here, this is called the initial point or the tail of the vector. And then the end is called the terminal point or the tip. So we have tip and tail, all right? This all look familiar for those of you who've seen vectors? Okay. So we can, any vector, when we move it left and right or up and down, these vectors are identical. Okay, these are the same vectors. And that's what, that's what makes vectors so important and what, that's what makes them uh, or distinguishes them from line segments. Line segments would connect two points together and then like a line segment from here to here would be two different points, right? So those would be two different line segments. But in terms of vectors, the position doesn't matter. All that matters is that the length stays the same and the direction you're pointing in stays the same. And this is very helpful when we're talking about forces. Because you may be applying a force to an object, moving it through space, but your force is always the same and pointing in the same direction, like dragging a body or something, right? So the vector can move around in the space without changing what it is, all right? So these vectors are equivalent. All right, now, in terms of how we write vectors, if you are given a, vec if you're given a vector that connects from one point to another, so uh, I can do it. Let me write this stuff down first. So let's say we have a point A, right, which uh, is the point X1, Y1, and we have a point B, which is X2, Y2. Then if we want to talk about the vector that goes from here to here, we'll call that the vector A to B like that then it is, the way we write it is we use these things called angled brackets instead of parentheses. Parentheses we use around points, ordered pairs, but we use angled brackets around vectors and it will just simply be this x-coordinate 
minus this x coordinate, and then this y coordinate minus this y coordinate. So it's very important that if you're going from here to here, you take the x coordinate on, of the point you're headed to and subtract the x point of where you came from. And then the y coordinate of where you're headed to minus the y coordinate of where you came from. And this is going to be the notation we use to represent that vector connecting those two points. Now, if we reverse it, right? If we reverse it and we want to go from B to A, what happens here? You end up having it's, uh, it's one yep, these two switch and these two switch, okay? So this little illustration just shows you the difference, right? The vector from A to B is that one, and the vector from B to A goes the other direction, right? They are not the same, are they? The vector from A to B is not the same as the vector from B to A. They both have the same length, right? But they're pointed in opposite directions, so they are not equivalent vectors. Now, if you go to three-dimensional space, okay, so now you imagine a vector in three-dimensional space, you can have a point that gives you, that has an x, y, and z coordinate, and then your point B has another x, y, and z coordinate, and again, if you're going to go from A to B, you subtract the coordinates. And then if you switch the order, you have to switch the order in which you subtract the coordinates. We'll, we'll practice here in a second, but those are the formulas. So let's just practice with this quickly. We may not do, we may not do every example. You'll see that in my notes, the examples are kind of this like purplish color. Those are the things I plan on doing in class. I may do the whole thing, I may do part of it, I may skip it. It just depends on how much we feel like we need to do. So let's, do, let's just do part B here. The vector from B to A. So I'm gonna use angle brackets. What goes first? If I'm gonna go from B to A. So I'm going from B to A. So I'm gonna, if I'm going to go to this one, then I'm going to start with this one. Go 6, take away what? The negative 2. And then comma, the next one would be negative 5, and then take away 8. And the last one would be 6, take away 10. All right? So this would be our, our vector. It would be the vector 8, negative 13, and negative four.